Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Ely, a geologist with the Nevada Division of Minerals. Thank you for joining me for part two of our erosion video series. Last time we explored the concepts of weathering and erosion by looking at how waves can shape the coastal landscapes that we see. During the first video, we learned that weathering is the process of big rocks breaking into smaller rocks called sediment. And erosion is the process that moves or transports the sediment from one location to another. But how do you think wind impacts the landscape around us? Is wind able to break and transport rocks like water can? Is wind a more powerful agent of erosion than water? In today's video, we are going to explore Aeolian processes. Aeolian processes refer to the activity of wind. The word Aeolian comes from Aeolus, a Greek god of the wind. Wind is actually quite effective at breaking and transporting rocks, particularly in environments that have few plants and a large supply of sediment or sand. A place that is dry, an environment much like the one we have here in Nevada, wind plays an important role in erosion in desert environments. Wind, like water, is capable of eroding and depositing materials. However, wind is not as powerful of an erosion agent as water. If you've ever been in a dust storm, then you have witnessed the erosional power of wind. Let's explore this idea. Wind erodes the Earth's surface by a process called deflation. Deflation is the removal of loose, fine-grained sediments by turbulent air circulation that develops when the wind flows alongside or over rough terrain, such as a mountain. This air circulation is known as an eddy, and they generally form on the lee or downwind side of these obstructions. The circular motion allows for fine-grained sediments to be lifted and blown away, just like the dust we see in the air on a windy day. One of my favorite geologic features in Nevada is desert pavement, much like the one we see in the picture. Desert pavement is a desert surface covered with closely packed rock fragments. There are several theories about how desert pavement forms and deflation, at least in part, plays a role in the development of these fragile surfaces. Even though all of the theories don't agree exactly on how desert pavement forms, they do agree that they all involve wind, erosion, and precipitation. Three ways in which sediments are transported by wind. The way in which a particle is transported is directly related to the size of the sediment. The first way in which wind transports sediments is by suspension. Suspension is when the smallest particles of sediment, so less than eight one thousandths of an inch, are held or suspended in the atmosphere. Suspension occurs when tiny sediments are lifted into the air and the upward air currents are strong enough to support the weight of the particles, and it holds them floating in the air indefinitely. Severe windstorms can hold large particles caught in turbulent eddies, like we discussed earlier, afloat for some time and push them to really high altitudes, which enhances their travel distance. Under strong wind conditions, suspended sediment particles can be lifted thousands of meters upward and travel thousands of kilometers downwind. The next way in which sediments are transported by wind is saltation. The word saltation comes from the Latin word for leaping. Saltation moves small particles forward through a series of skips or jumps. It is sort of like the rocks are playing leapfrog. Saltation typically lifts particles no larger than 0.4 inches in diameter above the ground by three to seven feet. These particles get lifted by the wind, bouncing along, traveling downwind, about four times the distance in which they were lifted into the air. These sediment particles are only suspended briefly as they are too heavy to remain in the air for long. A saltating particle may then hit another particle as it returns to the earth that will jump up and forward to continue the saltation process. 
When this happens, those particles that bump into each other are also working at breaking the particles into smaller pieces. This process is called attrition. Attrition refers to the breaking off of particles as a result of objects hitting against each other. Saltation is more or less a continuous process at high speeds. From a distance, a field of saltating particles may appear as if they're constantly suspended because it looks like this fuzzy layer next to the ground. The final way in which sediment is transported by wind is creep. Creep is caused by saltating particles hitting larger sediment particles too heavy to hop or skip. The saltating particles nudge the larger grains that are up to six times larger than those saltating particles and results in the sliding and rolling movement known as creep. Creep usually requires winds to exceed speeds of 10 miles per hour, which is not unusual for a windy Nevada day. When particles of sediment are transported by wind, by suspension, saltation, or creep, these particles are likely to run into each other or run into mountains or other rocks. And when they run into these other rocks, they're actually working at breaking up these rocks into smaller pieces or weathering them by the process of abrasion. Abrasion is the wearing down of surfaces by the grinding action and sandblasting of windborne particles. Let's look at a couple of erosional features that are the result of abrasion. In the top pictures, we see two ventifacts. Ventifacts are rocks which have been cut and sometimes polished by those pieces of sediment that are hitting the rock and being carried by the wind. A larger feature that you might see in actual landform is a yarding. A yarding can be tens of meters high and kilometers long, and they get hit by this wind with these particles in it, and that causes these yardings to be very streamlined by the desert winds. That's why they look the way they do in those bottom pictures where they're kind of narrow and long. So they're tall and long. Now it's time to start gathering your supplies for the activity. You'll need a pencil and you'll need to download and print the accompanying worksheet but if you don't have a printer or if you're like me and you're terrible about buying ink for your printer, you can just use a plain piece of paper. So pause the video now and gather your supplies and I'll see you in a few minutes. Before we get started, let's take a moment to go over the worksheet. We're going to be using the same worksheet for the first three videos in the series. The first thing we're going to do on the worksheet is identify the agent of erosion. In other words, what is causing the erosion? Is it water or is it wind? And we're going to circle our answer. The next part of the worksheet, we're going to draw a before picture in the box. I'm going to show you what our experiment, our erosion activity looks like before we run our model so that you can draw the landscape the way it looks before it's had erosion happen. After you draw the before picture, then you can form a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a prediction or an explanation that can be tested through a study or an experiment. In other words, it's a statement about what you think is going to happen. So I want you to write a hypothesis and tell me how you think the landscape is going to change from our model. After we've done these three parts of the worksheet, we will run the model. When the model is done, then we will draw an after picture. By drawing an after picture, we'll be able to compare it to our before picture and observe all the changes that have happened to our landscape. We'll also be able to review our hypothesis and answer our last question, was your hypothesis correct? 
So in other words, did the landscape change in the way that you expected? Or were you surprised by the results of our model? So you're again, you're just going to circle yes or no to whether your hypothesis was correct. Let's get started on our activity. For our model, we're going to use a plastic container, a couple of straws, and some sand and pebbles. My daughter Parker is going to assist me today by blowing through the straws to simulate wind. Now it's time to pause the video to complete the first three parts of the worksheet. Identify the agent of erosion, draw a before picture of the landscape, and form a hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen when we run the model? As Parker blows through the straws to create wind for our model, we can make observations about the way sediment is transported by wind. We can observe that the smallest grains are being picked up and suspended and transported to the very end of the container. We can also see that there are a lot of different grains that are saltating, so they're bouncing or skipping along. And that creates this fuzzy appearance at the bottom of the container. And as those saltating grains bounce along, they're running into other grains uh, like our pebbles and it's causing them to roll or slide ever so slightly in the process of creep. We can also observe the processes of deflation, so the wind picking up these grains and transporting them and abrasion as the wind blows these grains at these pebbles, those grains are working away at the pebbles, cutting them and polishing them. Now that the model is complete, we can pause the video to do the final two parts of our worksheet. First, draw an after picture. This is gonna allow you to compare it to your before picture, and then you can answer your final question. Was your hypothesis correct? Did the landscape change in the way you expected it to? Thank you all for joining me for part two of the erosion video series. I hope you'll join me next time when we take a closer look at how streams and rivers can modify landforms. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at rely at minerals.nv.gov. And if you enjoyed today's video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. And I'll see you guys next time for part three of the erosion video series.